Welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Dice, and this weekend our show features part two of a very interesting interview with Dr. Joe Salerno, who is the Vice President of Academic Affairs here at the Mises Institute and also a longtime professor of econ at Pace University in Manhattan. We are in the middle of a very interesting discussion about Austrian economics as a movement. Uh, Joe discusses just how bad and how cronyist modern academia really is and why it's so important to have organizations like the Mises Institute to, in effect, do an end run around academia and bring our message of libertarianism and Austrian economics directly to the intelligent layperson. So if you're interested in libertarianism generally and Austrian economics as a movement, I'm sure you will enjoy part two of our interview with Joe Salerno. Stay tuned. Should we really apply the term mainstream to sort of the modern mishmash of Keynesian neoclassical synthesis? This is the sort of the Krugman and Bernanke model. Are we implicitly giving them too much credit when we term them mainstream? Yeah, I, I think that that's a, a good question. And my answer to that would be that there is a mainstream that controls the, the, the or, or that dominates, let's put it that way, the top research universities. However, as I said, there's a growing dissatisfaction with this very narrow view of, of how economics should be done. And uh, you see people in lower tier schools and not, and not necessarily Austrian by any means and not necessarily pro free market by any means chafing at the bit, just wanting to, 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 to begin to change things. So I think across the spectrum, you have a dissatisfaction with what I might call mathematical formalism. Well, so you mentioned your work in dehomogenizing the Austrian school. Let's talk about that for a moment. Let's talk about factions in the world of Austrian economics. Are factions just part and parcel of any academic movement, are they helpful? Are they harmful? I mean, we have Mises corrects or disputes Menger on money way back when. Rothbard disputes Mises on utilitarianism. Uh, you have the Lachmanites splitting from the Rothbardians, especially on strategy. I guess you, the aforementioned, you know, Hayek versus Mises on purity. You have fierce disagreements about fractional reserve, political activism, working inside the beltway criticizing the Fed versus calling for its abolition. I mean, there seems like this is a movement that's riddled with factions. And I wonder if that is a strength or a weakness. Well, see, yeah, there's different ways you can use the term factions. Uh, um, diversity, I think, is a good word. You want a diversity of thought in the sense that you want the newer generations to build on, on what the older generations have done. You want the newer generations standing on their shoulders and advancing the science. Economics is not a closed science, despite what many people say. There are, for example, the financial crisis. Every time there's an event in the real world, which, which we haven't exactly seen in the past, you have to ad adapt economic theory to that. You have to develop it more and apply it. So that's all to the good. And there's going to be disputes during that process. Now, the problem with factions is, 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 is when they're concealed. Uh, and they were concealed by this term Austrian economics for a long time. And, uh, for example, there uh, people call themselves Austrians. Some of them believe that the market actually does move towards an equilibrium, that there's some perfect state out there that the market actually pushes you towards where all prices are equal to costs and so on. Um, and, and Israel Kurz is sort of the leader of that. He believes that the market actually equilibrates over time. But people like Mises and Rothbard believe, well, this equilibrium, this idea of this economy that never changes, this is just a, a mental construct of the economist to help us distinguish between profits and interests, which interests will always exist, you know, even where there's no uncertainty. So if we, we imagine a world where there's no uncertainty and we see that profits disappear, if everyone knows future prices, then all, all costs of production are bid up and all pro, pro, uh, profits disappear. That's, that's, that's a, a different view. We don't believe that the market actually moves in that direction or that it's, it would be good if it did. We just believe at every moment of time, the best entrepreneurs are the ones that produce what consumers most urgently want and do it most efficiently. And they're the ones that are earning profits. So profits actually always exist in the real world because there's continual change in the real world. So Mises and Rothbard don't lose sight of that. I think to some extent, those people who follow Kersner, and Kersner takes some inspiration from Hayek on this, really believe that somehow there's this market process that grinds down profits to zero. Yes, it's always working in that direction, but no, we never get to that perfect state where, where nothing changes. So factions aren't always just interpersonal. Factions can get to core theory and core practice. Yeah, yes. So those, those, those factions, I mean, that's good. You need that sort of debate for a movement to, to progress. The problem is when, when it, it becomes personal. Um, and also, I think there, there are some problems when there are different strategies being fo followed, though I like a diversity of strategies. So, for example, 
Mises oh, um, and, and Rothbard never understood this until I wrote my article on Mises as social rationalist. Mises used to say when he was at Fee that they, they and they planned to start a, a graduate school um, that every faculty member at, at the graduate school should always be giving popular lectures to media leaders, to business uh, decision makers, and so on. And Rothbard never really understood that. Um, but but then what Mises' point was: look, before we can change. The economy before we can change, you know, the the, the broad politics of, of, of our country of, of any country. You first need to change individual people's minds. You have to you have to make these ideas, some of which are you know pretty abstract. You have to make them palatable and comprehensible to the broad public. And I think this is one of the missions of the Mises Institute. We want to nurture these uh, very high level young scholars and and have them do uh, path breaking theoretical work, but at the same time. We want to be able to package these ideas and get them to the, to the public directly. The other view is that somehow, uh, and this view is said to come from Hayek, but I don't think it really does. It really comes from uh, Walter Grinder and Richard Fink, who were associated with, with IHS for a while and, 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 and um, uh, Mercatus now, Richard Fink is associated with Mercatus and so on. But their view is that the intellectuals have to talk to one another. And then some of what, what they talk about, not the intellectuals, let's, let's say the experts, let, let's say the economists, the, the pure thinkers, the ideas they come up with are then leaked down to the intellectuals, the journalists, the bloggers, um, e even clergymen, anyone who deals with ideas in any way. And then they pick up these little morsels and they're the ones then who then write the articles that attract uh, or, you know, uh, or, or actually go out to the masses. But Mises and Rothbard and, 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 and the Mises Institute, we don't believe that that's the way uh, that, that um, you, you, you reach out and, 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 and have change. We, we believe change comes from the, the people who, who are making up or are coming up with these ideas, the creators of these ideas themselves or, or their colleagues just reaching directly to the public, communicating with the public by any means possible. Well, there's an argument, Joe, that Academia is too far gone. In other words, uh, academic economists are too beholden to the Fed, too beholden to their system of tenure, et cetera, and that the, the, the raison d'etre of an organization like Mises Institute should be to do an end run around the gatekeeper known as academia and speak directly to the intelligent layperson. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's exactly what Rothbard came to see as, as, uh, in, later in his life, that that's what we have to do. And I think the Mises Institute is based on that vision. That is the short circuit the um, media elites, okay? The media elites will only listen to the Paul Krugmans of the world. They'll spread his ideas, for example, but they won't take us seriously. So we, ha we have to get around them. We have to reach out to the public directly. Well, but how do these gatekeepers come to be? In other words, talk about the system a little bit. How does the Fed and how do major universities seduce so many bright young PhDs into believing what we would characterize is a disastrously uncritical view of central banking, for example? I think this goes back to the 1960s. Uh, and the, the people who were in the new left at that point embraced this view of I believe it was an Italian um, sociologist, uh, uh, Marxist sociologist, uh, Gramsci, and he talked about the long march through institutions. What we need to do is to seed people into uh, academic institutions in particular, but other institutions that, that mold public opinion, you know, the, the newspapers and so on. And they followed that advice and, and they were incredibly successful. And they're the ones now that are in, in our universities and, and running our universities. And they're the middle management that the so-called shadow universities that are placing all these free speech zones and and um, harassing people for for um, not being sensitive in, in their remarks in the classroom and so on. So they're not just academics. They're also, um, as I said, administrators, middle level administrators in university. And, and it's, it's stifling free thought. I guess my fear is that we don't have time on our side. Incrementalism works one way, but I'm not sure that we have decades and decades to try to reverse this by putting good people into academia. That's right. I, I don't. I, I don't think you want to do that either. Though that's one strategy, for example, pushed by by other other libertarians. That is to just patiently march through universities and try to take them back. But they're pub. They're, they're public, and and you're not going to be able to to do the same same types of things that were done in the 60s and 70s. They're very closed now. Um, I think the better strategy is that we don't have to wait a long time. The crises are going to come harder and faster. The crisis that the state is, is, is um, generating, uh, both economic and political crises. And so what we have to do, I think, is to take advantage of those crises. Never, never waste a crisis. The state acts that way, but we have to act that way. We have to jump on it, explain it, and show uh, attribute it to, to the policies that have been, been implemented 
uh, you know, in the past 40 years since World War II by the, the welfare warfare state. We have to blame it all on them, and, and, that, and that's the way to, to change people's minds. Well, when it comes to changing minds, doing an end run, as we discussed, give me your thoughts about online, non-traditional methods. In other words, can the education bubble with its debt loads for these poor undergrads, can this really survive? And I think we can be standing there in the breach uh, it, when it doesn't survive. Yeah. I, I'm thinking that it can survive, and, and I'm, I'm certainly hoping that it doesn't survive. And I think you see it breaking down. I think parents are getting tired of shelling out all this money even after loans and so on, well, loans that have to be paid back and will never be paid back eventually. Um, so that the, the people are being, are, 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 I think, fed up or becoming fed up with the university system. And they're just looking around for an attractive alternative. And, and, and the market's supplying some of these alternatives, but I think we have to, 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 to step into the breach and, and, and push from our end the non-traditional ways of, of, of acquiring knowledge. Now, as an aside to a non-traditional perhaps tactic, does Austrian econ belong more in business schools than econ departments, given its emphasis on entrepreneurs and economic calculation? I don't think it belongs there ideally, but I think to take advantage of our opportunities, yes, we should exploit this opening in business schools. They're much more open than economics departments to Austrian ideas, and they embrace them. Uh, they don't know the ideological ba battles that were fought in the past uh, among between Austrian economists and, and, and Marxists and historicists and, and even and some and mainstream economists. And they don't care. They're just interested in the ideas. So in that sense, I teach in a business school and I think um, business schools are ripe for uh, penetration by Austrian ideas. Uh, and, 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 and they're considered part of the mainstream because we've written so much about entrepreneurship, for example, which was, you know, right, which um, mainstream economists completely ignore. In, in their textbooks. On this topic of Austrian sociology, you know, the other area where you've spent a great deal of your career is on the topic of money. Uh, here's my question for you is why is money such a blind spot for otherwise free market economists? Why do we have such a hard time demystifying central banking and commodity money in the Fed? Yeah, I, I think economists themselves have, have gotten themselves confused. The classical economists understood that money was simply another commodity. Um, a commodity that was was that had a function that pervaded the whole economy, but it was another commodity that had its own supply and demand. Value was determined by the same forces that determined other other um, value of other goods and services. They had a bad value theory, and that was replaced by the margin utility theory of the Austrians. At that point in time, when neoclassical economics came into being, the Austrians were part of that. But what happened was neoclassical economists began to say, "Well, money is really just a veil. It just." oils the economy and, and, and helps it to run better. It, 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 it really doesn't have a, uh, it's, it's not, its value is not determined in the same way as other goods and services. So they use something called the quantity theory, which is a big macroeconomic theory, not based on human choices. And it, it tries to explain the, the value of money in that way. Uh, and that was probably the late 1800s uh, that, that that occurred, early 1900s. But Mises, seeing the way things were going, wrote a, a great, his first great treatise um, in, in 19, uh, uh, 1911, on um, the theory of money and credit. And there, he took the classical insight and based it on a better value theory and showed that, in fact, the value of money is determined in the same way as any other, the value of any other good, and it's determined as a result of human choices, value scales, and actions. So that's where the Austrians really began to diverge from the, the, the new neoclassical movement. And I think because they have been viewing money as something that's apart from the market economy for so long, that they, they've confused themselves, and they've confused government policymakers, and this is why we have the, the crises and the problems that we have today with money. But Joe, I really see this divergence as our sweet spot. In other words, money and banking is the one area where no other school of thought, no other organizations are saying the kind of things that we're saying. No other schools of thought or organizations have an answer to, for instance, the, the bubbles and the crash of 08 and the crash that we believe is coming. So I really see as, as a tactical matter, as a wedge issue, that we should sort of be leading with money and banking in the Fed. I, I think Murray Rothbard saw that early on. And uh, so he, he, you know, he was first and foremost really a monetary economist. His dissertation was on the crisis of 1890, the panic of 1819. And he always, in the forefront of, of his writing, was always money and business cycles. He saw that as a key wedge um, you know, into the public consciousness for Austrian uh, economists. And I think we've kept that up. And I think you know, we, we, we are the ones who've, who have 
who, who we didn't get the timing, uh, and, and you can't, of course, Wall Street don't believe you can get the timing down of a crisis, but, but we saw the financial crisis coming. Many people who, who, who read Rothbardian, uh, Rothbard's works and who were explicit Rothbardians, people like Peter Schiff, our own Mark Thornton, were calling what was going on a housing bubble as early as 2003 when mainstream economists were saying, no, no, this is still part of the new economy. We have increased productivity. This is not a bubble in financial markets and the housing market. And they held that right up until the, in fact, right before Milton Friedman uh, passed away in 2006, he wrote an article um, that came out in the Wall Street Journal posthumously in which he was saying everything is going great with the economy. And he also had an interview in, in late 2005 uh, on Charlie Rose, which I recommend to everyone for everyone to listen to, in which he, he praises Alan Greenspan and the Fed's monetary policy since the, through the 19, from the 1990s onward. To the, to the high heavens. He gives them tremendous praise. So he didn't, he had no inkling that we were in for such a big drop. Only really the Austrians were. But isn't this incredible? I mean, Greenspan and Bernanke really believed, or at least expressed, that they had solved the, the problem of booms and busts and that they had created a new reality. No, that, that's absolutely true. Certainly true of Greenspan. Um, and and, and uh, Bernanke came a little bit later, but, uh, but, but, but he believed that that monetary uh, writing from about the 19, late 1980s onward it w was responsible for what was called the Great Moderation. And the Great Moderation was that the economy from the mid-80s to 2005 or so, the economy had um, reduced the, the intensity of, of booms and busts and the inflation rate remained low. So they thought they had solved the problem basically of, of, of business cycles. But that was the same thing that economists believed in the 1920s. When, when prices were stable, even though the Fed was pumping money into the system like crazy, creating financial bubbles, real estate bubbles, and commodity bubbles. So, you know, it's there's nothing new under the sun with, with these people. Right. Well, we should definitely have you on another time to talk at length about money, about capital in interest theory, about so many things. But I want to leave you today with a question. We all get this quite a bit. I know you've given it some thought, but it, it goes to the role of the Institute, the Mises Institute itself. In your view, should the Institute exist primarily to promote Austrian economics, or should we be devoted to a larger, broader libertarian mission? Well, I see our our specific mission as, as, as promoting Austrian economics, but also deriving the implications for, uh, for uh, you know, all other uh, aspects of, of society and, and, and politics. So I don't think we should shy away from the uh, policy conclusions that flow from Austrian economics with some ethical judgments, of course. You can't just get policy conclusions without making your own ethical judgments. But so, so I guess, you know, it's, it's something to, to think about but, but I, I, I like the focus on Austrian economics as, because it's, it's an economics that's really different than, than any other economics. And it, takes, it, it starts from the individual, individual choice and values. And I think that's key. And that's key to defending a free society. So given that this is a scientific basis for a free society, I, th I think we should retain it. Joe, I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for a fascinating and I will say wide-ranging interview. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.